Hold up, boys. Destiny 2's most tantalizing villain makes her play in the new expansion, The Witch Queen. We spoke with the creative director, James Tsai, to learn what fans can expect and got a bevy of exclusive new screens. Check out our full preview and feature here. Let's go look at it. Oh, 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 thick article. Is there a night mode? Yes, that is much better. All right, Destiny 2 The Witch Queen preview. Riddles wrapped in a mystery by Matt Miller. It's time for the payoff. For years, Bungie has teased the potential of Destiny's most devious villain. In recent months, that tease has escalated. The Hive Queen named Savathun has infiltrated all the major storylines, insinuating herself into the events shaping the story. Now, at last, at long last, the Witch Queen's trap is sprung as she co-ops humanity's most precious resource, the light that gives powers to its guardians, and uses that power to make deathless warriors of her own. I'll show you a tease. <laughs> With the Witch Queen, Bungie is betting big on a narrative twist that's been in the making for a long time and using that storytelling moment to push forward new twists on the long-established gameplay model, including a dramatic move toward a playstyle customization for players. On the eve of the expansion's release, we spoke with the project's creative director and got the scoop on what longtime players, lapsed guardians returning to the fold, and even newcomers can expect to discover in the next few months. The villain Savanthun, the most cunning high foe that we've ever had, is front and center, says creative director James Sai. Dude, I, I hope I'm saying his name right. I think that is right. Uh, and, it could, and it would not be Savanthun's story if there were no trickery. She is the god of cunning. That focus on treachery, hidden meanings, and secrets doesn't end because Savathun has now revealed her true identity and stepped into the light. And it sounds like a primary focus of the Witch Queen experience is matching his wits against such a wily foe. We've actually been talking about this as a mystery, Sai continues. The player fantasy is one of being like a psychic detective this time around, and you're going into this uncertain destination. This creepy, beautifully grotesque, twisted wonderland kind of place. Or what's the mystery here? What can you trust? Honestly, from the first trailer, that was exactly the vibe that I got. It was like, we're playing as like Detective Guardian. Like when um, when we went in and like she came back and her, her mind seemed like fragmented. Like she didn't know exactly what she saw. She was just kind of like piecing together what she saw and was telling Ikora everything, right? I can trust Moth Mommy. Yeah. What are all these? What if all these trailers are fake? Actually though, right? What if? What if these exotics aren't even real? Those dynamics of beautifully grotesquerie are on full display in the player space that Sai is describing. Savathun's throne world is a sprawling new area for a player to explore, filled with secrets and opportunities for combat across several distinct regions. A reflection of Savathun's mind, the throne world is an old hive realm that is being remade and blessed by the light that Savathun has stolen. She has the light, so she has this opulent, well-manicured castle. Cool sculptures, courtyards. It's not the typical hive area. Actually, though, it's not. If y'all remember the picture, it's actually a beautiful place, right? It's not the typical hive area. Then you have this swamp here, bayou kind of area that she has not yet rebuilt with the light. And then there's this underworld section as well. There's even a new six-person matchmade activity called Wellspring that plays out in the throne world, built to convey the fantasy of storming the seemingly insurmountable castle. Conceptually, the swamps Heat and humidity represent something novel and distinct from what we've previously seen from the franchise. It's essentially, it's Louisiana is what it is. The, the, the swampy territories. Um, holy crap. Okay, okay. Yeah, so a, a visual of what they're talking about. When you see this, you don't think of a, of a hive world, right? You think of this wonderland is, is, is really the best way they put it. And I guess it's like Savadoon's like dream fantasy world. Across that new landscape, Bungie has big plans to make the new campaign especially memorable. We call it the Definitively Destiny Campaign, Sai says. It's about bringing some of the awesome grandeur of some of our in-game aspirational feel into the campaign itself, soaring through these really cool environment set pieces, memorable encounters that take a lot of thought and understanding, bringing puzzles into the campaign for players. That There's a really reinvigorated focus on the campaign in this release. Les, when was the last time we had like a, I guess beyond like we had a campaign, but like, oh, seasonally we've, we've moved away from it. Like remember, remember seasonal expansions used to always have like major campaign. Like there was big movements in the campaign as well. 
Yeah. What was that? Right after Forsaken or after the year of Forsaken, going into Shadow Keep, we kind of moved away from that. I think uh, uh, over the, over think... the narrative drops, right? But they they mentioned before how they wanted to get back to making like they wanted to make a dope campaign because that's a complaint that I think I've seen from Skill Up and other players. It's like the initial grabber, which is the campaign, wasn't grabbing enough. Uh, where it's like we're keeping up a little more because of the lore and stuff and the seasonal content has improved but we haven't had that that halo 3 that driving campaign you know what i mean i'm hoping we're gonna get that the campaign's renewed importance also means new ways to play beyond the classic experience players can confront a legendary version of the campaign that translates into more enemies with more significant health pulls increased modifiers on combat and tweaks to darkness zones that ensure players can't trivialize encounters in return Players can expect commensurate rewards with gear bundles that help push your guardian into raid readiness, upgrade modules, and even the possibility of exotic drops. Oh, did you get that, Les? Yeah. We're going to get drops from the campaign. As figured. As figured? When was the last time we got, like, have you gotten an Ascendant Shard? And I know they didn't say Ascendant Shard here, but campaigns have never been something that, like, rained loot ever. It was more of a means of, like, you just got through it and then you immediately jump to the next thing and then you grind it in-game content. I don't ever remember other than like a, an exotic quest that was tied to maybe a campaign mission actually giving me an exotic drop. We've gotten static exotic drops. Oh man. I'm Beyond just... Light gave us armor piece at the end of the story. Exotic armor. Yeah, but what I'm getting from this is exotic, like, like increase of... of Again, the, the term raid readiness. All right, well, how do you get raid ready? You get the soft cat, then you do comp, and I mean, then you're raid I, ready. I know, but realistically, you need you need a slew of upgrade modules, ascendant shards, prisms, and exotic drops, right? Like just just from rewards reward standpoint, something in which we only see from like Grandmaster Nightfalls. I'm not saying like campaigns are gonna make it rain, but it, I wouldn't be surprised if they really open the faucet on this to allow everyone to be raid ready just from the campaign. Um, the legendary campaign also features a new approach. And by the way, I mean, it's going to be a legendary campaign. They're going to have to make it worth doing, right? The legendary campaign also features a new approach to fire team size, adapting content and enemies depending on the number of guardians in your playgroup. Our intent is to make sure that there is no wrong way to play this, Sai says. You want to you wanna play by yourself? You're doing it. You want to play with friends? You'll get the same tough experience and that same accomplishments. Whether in classic or legendary difficulty, players should expect one significant challenge to remain constant, the dire threat of the Lucent Brood. While players will still face the entire Coterie. Where is that? <laughs> Coterie. Coterie. Small group of people with shared interests or tastes, especially one that is exclusive of other people. While players will still face the entire Coterie of Hive enemies they fought for years, Savathun's forces are joined by new variants empowered by the light. Like player character guardians, the Lucent Brew will supers and rise back from the dead after defeat. It really does change the sandbox experience against them, Sai says. It's not just like fighting a set of hive with new pajamas. You have to take these abilities into consideration. You gotta watch them, them coteries. Them cooteries. I mean, I just want to call it cooteries so bad. Uh, mm -hmm. Players can expect to confront newly empowered knights glowing with void shields like a titan. Arc power wizards fling out electrical attacks and solar fueled acolytes will have fans of flaming knives. Upon death, these high threat enemies remain dormant for, for a few seconds until their ghosts bring them back to life and full health. Dude. So we have, you, ha you have to kill the ghosts, which I mean, obviously, right? But only a few seconds? What I would if say you, a few seconds, like three or four seconds. What if, what if you killed it from afar and you don't close the gap in time? I guess you just got to kill it again. You better haul your ass over there. Damn. There may be like a an optimal finish build, like an invis go in, and and take them out. You know what I mean? I could see Eager's Edge being pretty good for certain situations like that. That's true too. Yeah, you just go in and you finish them. You just boom, TP go there, straight you know? to them and get the finish off. Uh, yeah. Your only option is to risk closing the distance to the enemy ghost and then tapping your finisher to grasp and then crush them, ending the threat. Meanwhile, more standard hive enemies will get powered up by moths that infuse them with light. So, you might fight an acolyte who is charged with light, and when you defeat that acolyte, then the moth comes flying out, 
and it seeks to infuse its power into another one of nearby combatants, or it comes after you and tries to detonate, Sai explains. Add up the implications and battle against the Lucent Brood aim. Aim for high intensity encounters that require up close confrontations to end the fighting definitively. To increase your chance of survival, Guardians have a few new tricks of their own. The Glaive appears in both exotic and legendary variants and acts as a combo melee and ranged weapon with significant potential for destruction. It's our first new weapon archetype in the game since Bows, and it's the only first person melee weapon we have, Sai says. Unlike the sweeping arc of swords, the glaive is squarely targeted at single foe engagements. Aggressive jabs can be strung together with multiple button presses to produce a fluid combo. A glaive can also shoot out an energy blast at short or medium range and features a defensive shield that powers up as you defeat enemies. Interesting. So, so a defensive shield that powers up as you defeat enemies. I'm assuming that's going to use... It's, the glaive has got to have like that charge. So I'm assuming it's going to consume the glaive charge when you do the defensive shield. I wonder how much you can actually block with it. Glaives are just one of many weapons you can build and tweak with a new weapon crafting system. This complex new system fulfills a desire many players have voiced for years. A chance to devise their own custom arsenals, modifying weapons to support a personal playstyle. Weapon crafting starts with a pattern, which can be used to create the initial form of a given weapon. Using that weapon in combat gains levels that enable you to further tweak its capabilities from intrinsic properties like a range or handling increase to magazine attributes and other more consequential adjustments. Eventually, you'll be able to alter its core traits and perks like Rampage or Killing Wind. You're also gathering crafting resources, both through distinct sources out in the game world as well as, well as by dismantling other weapons. Optional consumable mementos even let you unlock cosmetic changes to your weapons guys i'm doing this all with one eye so if i'm missing words and we're skipping sentences forgive me right now all of these weapon changes are enabled through the use of the relic both to create and subsequently customize your perfect tool of destruction it's a new focus for investment in the game and personalization of your experience and it's treated as such a designated place you visit that features numerous options for making a given weapon your own the reason we have this relic is that we wanted this to feel like a personal, sacred, and emotional, intimate moment for you and, and given it some importance in the universe, Sai says. Oh, so the relic has to be that thing? That thing? Is that, is that, is it the swinging thing? Is it this thing? Because this that's part of the glaive, right? Relic is the I think, I think it's the thing in the, in the thing in the middle. It's the thing right there, right? Yeah, I think it's the thing that's hanging. The relic is the whole thing. The whole setup is the relic. Um, the Witch Queen is also set to see a further push toward play customization through revising the void subclasses. That retrofit is first such such reorganization of light-based subclasses planned for the year, with both Arc and Solar intended for rollout in the later seasons. To get a sense of what to expect. Look no further than the recent launch of the darkness based stasis supers or powers with their aspects and fragments that let players reshape their approach to play. When applied to void classes, players shouldn't expect entirely new power or race. Instead, it's about mixing and tweaking the existing power trees to build craft the exact character you want. We really feel it is a big quality of life improvement for those light subclasses, being able to just just optimize the way you play. I wonder if they're going to give us any indication to less probability time what are the chances my titan can use devour i think high possibility because remember we have these debuffs and the buffs the buffs give overshield pretty much it's kind of like you're regening your health everyone in the chat is saying zero percent okay where are we at after a significant delay that pushed the witch queen into the new year destiny 2 players have high expectations for a refresh that invigorates the long-running hobby game while the full scope of the refresh won't be apparent until weeks into the new expansion, it's safe to say that Bungie has a clear plan ahead for the continued evolution. After all, the Witch Queen is just the first in line of the of named expansions already in the books. But before the final shape can coalesce, the complete picture of Savathun's deceptions and trickery must come to light, and those developments have the attention of rap of a rap fan base. Am I saying that now? Right? Chat, look, here's the thing. You know, I'm. You ever wonder you're like cross where the who educated you i'm from louisiana oh, hey yo we nailed that shit that, that's, that's pretty close all right um and then we get to see the pictures let me full screen this oh so here's the swamp can i just say this area this area looks amazing 
Which one? The swamp? Just the whole, like, the whole air, like, the whole theme of the areas that we're getting. These it are, just looks so cool. These are new pictures. I have, like, that looks sick. The freaking I, Dreamy City looking one is sick. Like, they I, all look really cool. I have not seen this on the press kit chat. These are new pictures. Those are Scorn as well, which is kind of funny. Oh, Sabbath. You looking so good, girl. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was from the trailer right here. Okay, okay. Looks like an, it's not a swamp area. Yeah, so Scorn. We know we're going to be dealing with Scorn. I don't really know how. Is Sabbath going to be controlling the Scorn? I think I read in a comment last week that no one controls the Scorn. Isn't the dream, isn't her throne world just like her imagination of what she thinks is perfect or something like that? Yeah, I mean it's 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 her it's her dream. It's her and dream. So she world. can she can literally put anything she wants in there, right? Mm-hmm. So she generated scorn. Shrek strike know. confirmed. Um, okay. By the way, chat, I'll I'll link this article in here if y'all want to check it out yourself. Um Mop Luke. Slap that like button like your mama told you right. <laughs>